Good morning, Brazil. It is wonderful to be here. I am about to harness all of your dreams and carry them into space with me by making space for all and sharing the view. So let's start off with the impossible. Do you know that 50 years ago, five decades ago, they said that landing on the moon was impossible? But a small academy of precision professionals came together and in a fairly short order of time were able to launch us in less than 10 minutes after liftoff off the planet and in less than 90 minutes after liftoff around the Earth and in less than three days land us on the moon. That's pretty incredible. Today, we're on the verge of human raiding Orion. That's our government space vehicle. But there's also commercial space that's ready to possibly launch humans as early as next year. But let's talk about the vehicle that helped to stage this possibility. And that would be the space shuttle. The space shuttle. 17,500 miles per hour, coming off of seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Where under your seat is enough power to light the opening Olympic ceremonies in every city of the world. And the sheer force of the vibration makes you close your eyes so tightly that you never actually see your first launch. You experience it. You're launched. You are now approximately 250 miles above the Earth, going 17,500 miles per hour on your way to Mach 25. It's been less than eight minutes and 30 seconds, and as you unbuckle your seatbelt, guess what? You're floating. And the first word out of your mouth is, whoa! You know what the second word is? Whoa! There you go. This is how it is. But how does one get from training to view the world and the universe and innovation through the lens of weightlessness. By the way, while traveling Mach 25. Well, for me, it didn't work with the tricycle. Not fast enough. Couldn't make, you know, the, the orbital um, lift requirement. But you know, it's interesting, now we're actually using some tricycle technology as we move forward in launching folks. But yeah, it didn't make that you know, envelope to, to get out of the atmosphere. So then there was, of course, things like Spaceship Enterprise and other designs. Yeah, we're getting pretty close to those things, rocking it off the planet. But you know what it really takes to leave the planet and push new frontiers? It takes the human and the human resiliency that goes along with it. So how do you get there? Well, for me, it started at the top of an old oak tree one hot summer night, July 1969. I was playing a game called Hind Go Seek. That's where you hide, everyone tries to find you. And I had gotten so good that I wanted to break the world record. And I was on the verge. I was at two hours and 59 minutes. I don't even know what the record was, but that had to have been a long time. No one could find me. Why? Because everyone was looking right and left, east and west. No one was thinking about looking north and south 
Well, okay. My brother Steve was thinking about looking south because he still believes I've climbed out from under some rock. But really, nobody was looking north. And that's where I was, at the top of that old oak tree, dancing with the stars, talking to the man on the moon, dreaming about joining them, when suddenly, out of the darkness, the wilderness, I heard a voice calling my name. Yvonne, Yvonne, Yvonne. And I knew destiny had finally found me. I was ready to take that next giant leap. Not a wise thing to do if you're 10 years old. Not a wise thing to do at any age if you're at the top of an old oak tree. Just before I took that leap, I suddenly recognized that voice. It was my dad calling me to come down from the tree and come inside, and I was just like, oh my god, you know, one minute short of the record, what is this? So I climbed down, whispering under my breath, because, you know, you never want your dad to hear, is like, this better be good or else I'm never listening to him again. Well, apparently it must have been pretty rockin' awesome, because here I am today. If he had heard what I was whispering, it might have had a different outcome. So I go inside, and he's silently pointing to this old TV. Not old back then, but it's when this grainy image, okay? The kind of TVs that still had the antennas, the rabbit ears, and my job as the fifth youngest was to, you know, hold the rabbit ears. But he wasn't having me hold the rabbit ears. I was getting to watch, so I knew it was something very big. And you know what it was? human, walking on the moon for the very first time. And you can only imagine what I did. I immediately ran back outside, looked up at the moon, because remember, I had just been having the conversation, right? And guess what I saw? Uh, nothing. I thought I had missed it. So I go running back inside, and he's still on the TV. So what did I do? I ran back outside, and guess what I saw? Uh, nothing. So for the same amount of time that I was at the top of the old oak tree, now I was running back and forth for about two hours, trying to see if I could see the man walking on the moon that I had just been talking to. And guess what I never saw? Never saw. Never saw a human on the moon. But after a while, what I did begin to see was that the only thing more amazing than human walking on the moon for the very first time was what I must look like to that man on the moon, granted, a silly 10-year-old running back and forth inside, uh, from the moon back on Earth. Suddenly, I too wanted to have that view. I, too, wanted to one day see my footprint on the moon. At that moment, my dreams took wings. Fast forward, undergraduate in biochemistry, San Francisco State University, on to the University of Washington School of Medicine, where I earned my medical degree on a military and Air Force scholarship. So it was wonderful. I only needed to pay back four years, but 22 years later, after rising to the rank of full bird colonel and senior flight surgeon, taking care of the pilots, air crew, and their families, 22 years later of yanking banking in all sorts of high-performance aircraft, from F-111s to F-15s, F-18s, helicopters, heavy, air-to-air -air refuelers, medevacs, really anything going to altitude, I wanted to be in it. But after about 15 years, I realized that those jets, they didn't seem to go quite fast enough, nor quite high enough. I knew then that the only way to go at that time was the space shuttle. And the only way to get there was by way of my dreams. Just think, eight minutes, 30 seconds, you're floating. Who needs main engines? Who needs solid rocket boosters? Or as Story Musgrave, one of my favorite astronauts, said, floating, it's like skating on glass. Oh my goodness, if I could put poetry to motion, I call it the space shuttle with its space transportation system. 
So from 30,000 years ago, when we placed the first human handprint in a cave in France, they've done studies. The hands of men and women were different then, and they've been able to, with a high degree of confidence, determine that this was probably a woman's hand. So that first, placing that first handprint all the way to that first footprint, planting that first footprint on the moon, the journey, folks, is just beginning. Yes, we are going to Mars. 2035, mark your calendars. But we're going now by way of the moon. Yes, we are going back to the moon. 2024 is when we're slated. That's just six years away. We plan to do two cislunar missions, 30 day each, where we will be on the moon testing vehicle systems, communication systems, robotic systems, satellite systems, all of these systems. But we're also going to be testing out things like 3D printing, robotics, rovers, CubeSats. These are just a few of the platforms. But best of all, we're going to be checking out the human systems. Here we have what I like to call Smithsonian Rex. Smithsonian Rex has these microchips in his retina that allow him to see, implants in his ears that allow him to hear. He's got synthetic speech. He has artificial skin. He has heart, lung, spleen, kidneys, pancreas that are all artificial and perfused by synthetic blood. He has limbs that are able to move, hands that can grip and rotate in 26 degrees of rotation, just one short of the human hand. He has an exoskeleton that allows him to stand. He has shock absorbers that allow him to jump. We could just send Smithsonian Rex. And we are. Robotics will be our precursor missions to sort of set things up for us so that when we arrive, systems should be up and running. But that's the operative word, when we arrive, because the human has to be part of the conversation, because it is the human spirit to explore. And how else do we know if we don't go? But what is that going to take? Well, we're going to have to Look at how our human system changes when exposed to radiation, microgravity, increased carbon dioxide levels, when it's exposed to disruptions in our diet, exercise, and microbiome. We've already determined that our GNA shifts, it drifts, it changes, our gene expression changes. Our, our body actually almost turns upside down on itself. Our muscles and bones, they start to weaken and decondition. Even our microbiome that lives inside of us becomes different. All of our organs shift around. So here we are going in search of aliens when we may find that the alien we go in search of is within ourselves. So pretty amazing. That's what we want to check out before we go to Mars. And there are things that can help us. Things like the NASA biocapsule, a small inert nanotechnology the size of your thumbnail that can slip under your skin into your system and be able to detect inflammation, infection, cancer, certain cancers, and not only detect, but actually deliver medication. So before you're even aware of symptoms, symptoms you're already being treated. We're looking at neuroscience and neurocognitive early metrics or markers that can give us an early indication of our behavioral health and wellness before it starts to drift and fragment us or disrupt our performance and safety from things like sensory deprivation, sleep deprivation, um, work task overload, so many different things that can happen. So we want an early insight into this. Back in the day, one of the early 
innovations that we had was something called the Iron Apron, which is, as I said, your organs float. Your heart's no longer on the left side of your chest. It floats to the middle. Your appendix may float behind you. So it's important that we do earth-based normal ultrasound so we know where our organs are before we leave so that when we get into space, they repeat it and we can get an idea of how it's shifted. But your blood volume also floats up towards your chest and your head. And the iron apron was a way to train on the ground and in space to sort of normalize, move some of that blood volume back because that hydrostatic is very important, that hydrostatic pressure to keep you from getting lightheaded and hopefully to slow down the loss of muscle while you're exercising. Not entirely where we need to be to optimize, but we're on our way. But let's talk about bone and muscle. This is what I think is really fascinating to me. Do you know that we already talked about in only eight minutes and 30 seconds, you are off the planet. You're going Mach 25 and you're floating. That's the best. It doesn't get any better. But that's the view. Do you know that in less than one minute later, eight minutes and 31 seconds, you are already losing the space race based on your physiologic condition. We're 70% water, so the little bit of bone and ligaments and skin really doesn't change the fact that just as if you were at the beach, the beautiful beaches in Brazil, we're basically a huge wave, a huge upheaval, like a wave that turns you upside down onto your head when you go into space. And that's what happens from that physiologic perspective. But the most impactful area besides radiation, which will strain your immune system um, and, and give you some other um, problems with your metabolics, but the number two challenge that we have is bone and muscle. We know that bone softens, demineralizes, but the solution, at least the, the trajectory that I'm going on, is that the best remedy for the bone, because we've tried bisphosphates, pills, ultrasound, treadmill, and they have some effect, but still not optimal. The best solution for the bone is the muscle. If you don't have gravity, if there's some way to keep the load from the muscle on the bone, you're halfway home, if you want to go home. Personally, I want to colonize, so if you wake up and I'm on your spaceship, you probably, I'm not the view you want to have, because I don't want to come back. So it's very important that we find a solution for the muscles to keep them strong. But that's just under regular circumstances. What happens if you get an injury? If you sprain your, your hand or your, your wrist, your arm, your leg, what happens? Well, after about 84 days, somewhere around three months, your growth hormone starts to drop off enough where you begin to lose up to 10% of your muscle mass and strength. That's a lot. That's significant. That's on a good day. On a bad day, when somehow you've might manage to strain or sprain a limb, only six days, days later, you were to the point where that muscle may be so weakened from the injury and the way that the muscles are atrophying that it may be very difficult to rehabilitate that muscle so that you can safely perform, evacuate, or possibly be able to be fit to return home. You have immediately made yourself from a Mars visitor to a Mars colonizer. It's a real condition we have to think about. That's how important the muscles are. You need muscles just to lift a spoon to feed yourself. So we need to find a rapid, effortless way, since you're deconditioned and weak, to rehabilitate yourself under any condition, but especially if you're injured. So now that we have a view on the impossible from Mars, can we look to Earth to find a solution? Well, this is my favorite part. The best thing about innovation is that it enables 
exploration, including in space. And the best thing about space exploration is that it inspires invention. So, how do we get there? Well, we know we're weakening. We know we don't want to get injured, and if we do, we want a solution. So is there a solution on Earth? Possibly. It's called lift. What is lift? Well, lift is a series of protocols, a different way of doing business, a way to disprove the impossible. Lift is a series of rapid and effortless protocols that can, well, that's been shown to accelerate the, and amplify the powered growth of new muscle. But what's even more exciting, it's, it's been demonstrated to take a limb that's inflamed from an injury or some other source of inflammation and turn, again, rapidly and effortlessly weeks of therapy into days and days of pain into minutes. You can only imagine the application here on Earth exploration. Injury after surgery, those who are differently abled, those in wheelchairs who may be able to walk in an exoskeleton, those who can have a tendon replacement and be able to have a prosthetic for their arm. After chemotherapy, the elderly, or anyone sitting in this room right now who has some kind of inflammation. So how does that work? How is it able to do that? Well, the best way to describe it is imagine you're driving a car, your car, somebody else's car, your mother's car. OK, not your mother's car. Anyway, you're driving a car. For some reason, you drive off the side of the road. But the engine is still running, and the wheels are still spinning. So if we could, couldn't we just take that car, lift it up, put it back on the road, let the wheels gain traction, and since the engine is still running, what's going to happen with that vehicle? It's going to propel itself forward. It's going to start driving like it had never driven off the road. That's lift. It is able to, in a rapid, effortless, but regenerative way, take the energy from injury, mobilize it, and rebalance inflamed strains and sprains that are decades or days old, and do that, in most cases, in less than a week. So it's possible. And that's the important message that is lift. But you know what's more amazing than being able to see injury and inflammation, strains and sprains, turned around so rapidly in so many people is the power that comes from pursuing the impossible. Knowing that your body has this impossibly incredible power to heal itself. And if the body can do that, well, we can do the impossible too. My moonshot, if anyone cares to know, is, as I said, to disprove the impossible. In a world that's gone awry, or seems to, there are at least two things that we still have control over. What we choose to believe, and what we choose to dream. And if we harness that power, even the impossible has potential. Because think about it, really. What is the impossible after all? 
If you break it down and decode the word, what do you get? I am possible. We can do this. And it just takes us being able to believe. I have people come to me all the time saying, you know, I always wanted to be an astronaut, but because of family, finances, college, culture, any list of things, I didn't. The first thing that always launches to my mind is, so why did you give up on and give away your dream? I'm not an astronaut because I trained to go to space. I'm an astronaut because an astronaut is simply someone, anyone, who dares to aspire to something greater than self. So I invite you, each one of you, to join me and be the astronaut too. What dream trajectory do you hold in your human heart that you care about enough, that you believe in enough to possibly correct the course of this, our mothership Earth, and conceivably even change the course of time? What does it take? Well, simply, it takes believing that it can be done in what you can do. So we talked about lift. What does lift look like? It's harder to tell you what lift looks like than to ask you what 10 minutes looks like. So if you see, this is a severely sprained knee, and that bruising, the blue part has a lot of swelling. This woman has 10 out of 10 pain, doesn't want to, isn't even able to lock her knee, and she's been pretty much bedridden through the weekend. This is what 10 minutes look like. looks like. It's the same bruise as you can see, so you know it's the same leg. The swelling is down, the knee is locked, 10 out of 10 pain is zero out of 10 and she's running around playing volleyball by the next weekend. It's neat to be a part of this. It's wonderful to have a view on what seems so impossible. It's wonderful to know the possibilities of the human body and the human spirit. So if this is what the body can do, just think what the human spirit can do. So follow your dream trajectory the only thing it takes is being able to bring poetry in motion back down to earth and then use it to launch your dreams back to the moon, onto Mars, or somewhere far and beyond whatever lies just to the other side of the I am possible. Ad Astra Obrigado. Thank you. <laughs>